Well, here we are in Philadelphia, love of the brethren. Let's see what Jesus thought of the church here. Letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. What would Jesus think about the little group of Christians here in the town that was planted here to spread Greek culture to the east of this land and further afield to Asia? Here was this church. What was it going to do? This is a message from the one who is unutterably holy and absolutely true. He holds in his hand King David's key to God's house, and when he opens a door, nobody can shut it again. And when he shuts a door, nobody can open it again. I know all about all you are doing. Look, I have flung wide a door right in front of you. I know that you don't seem to have much power or influence, but the important thing is that you have faithfully done whatever I told you to do, and you have never been ashamed of my name. Watch how I will deal with that synagogue of Satan who claim to be true Jews but are telling lies you will see me force them to come and prostrate themselves at your feet, admitting that my love has been showered on you and not on them. Because you have been as patient as I told you to be, I now promise to protect you from the worldwide trouble that will soon test all those living on the earth. I'm coming back as soon as possible. Just hold on firmly to everything you've got from me and don't let anyone deprive you of your prize. Anyone who wins through will become a pillar of strength in the temple of my God, and he will have the special name of my God inscribed upon him as well as the name of the city of my God, that new Jerusalem which will come down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him a third name, the new name that I will then have. Let everyone who hears these letters read take heed of what my spirit is communicating to all the seven churches. When we look at the letters side by side again, we notice the last three form a kind of sandwich. Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, nothing good, nothing bad, and nothing good. And Philadelphia is squeezed in between these two churches in a very serious condition. I just want you to try and imagine the, the Philadelphian congregation. They've heard the letters to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, and uh, Sardis. And Sardis has been a really rough letter. And now it's Philadelphia's turn. I can imagine them almost holding their breath. What's he going to say about us after all that? <laughs> and the relief that they must have felt when he said, I have nothing to criticize. Well, let's go back and look at the city. First of all, again, a key city because it's on the borders of three different counties, the counties of Lydia, Mysia, and Phrygia in the province of Asia. So it's a key place. It's on the borders of these three counties. There are road and river junctions. Indeed, it was called the Gateway to the East. If you've been, I think, is it to St. Louis in America? They now have a huge parabola arch hundreds of feet high. They call themselves the gateway to the west. This was the gateway to the east. It was founded as a Greek colony, the furthest Greek colony into Asia. And uh, they founded it quite deliberately as a gateway to take Greek language and culture up onto the main high plateau of what we now call Turkey. So it was essentially, from the very beginning, seen as a missionary town but not a missionary town to spread the gospel, a missionary town to spread what we call Hellenism, the Greek culture and way of life, which they believed was the best and they were expanding as an empire and they'd had little difficulty 
implanting Greek culture on the coast. But as they spread further inland, they encountered these Phrygians, these hill people who were very old-fashioned, very conservative, very obstinate. Well, I'm sure I need say no more. There are even parts of our own country a bit like this, as you will find if you go and live there. And uh, they clung to their own customs and their own religion and their own ways of life. And so Philadelphia is planted to spread a different way of life, to spread the good news, as they thought it, of Greece and its philosophy and its culture and its entertainment and all the rest. Secondly, I want to remind you of the environment. We are now in what is called the burnt land, a lot of volcanic uh, lava around, the soil is really ground up from volcanic lava. It's a volcanic region. And that, of course, makes it quite fertile, especially for vines. Vines grow very well in ground-up lava in volcanic areas. And not surprisingly, the god of this town was Dionysius, the god of wine. So it was very fertile, but it also meant that it was a very perilous place to live. You never quite knew when there'd be another earthquake. And so very often you'd find the people of Philadelphia were having to run out of the city to escape the falling buildings. Time and again they had to rebuild. They were always going out. That comes out in the letter where Jesus said, you'll go out no more. They would understand what that meant. That meant fleeing for your life when the whole place was shaking and these huge stones were tumbling down into the street. It also meant that there were a lot of hot health springs nearby. So you've got this strange mixture of a perilous place to live and yet one that was prosperous, fertile, and healthy. The third thing I want to say about is this, that they were constantly having to rebuild after the earthquakes and therefore they had a preoccupation with buildings. And funnily enough, this letter seems full of doors and keys and pillars and parts of buildings, which again would uh, make sense to them. Fourth thing is their gods and temples. They had so many on one hilltop, they, they literally called it Little Athens. They had model Parthenons up there and it was Little Athens. So the Greeks had really established an outpost of Athens, their capital city in Greece, here at Philadelphia. One more thing, this city constantly changed its name, constantly getting a new name. So you had to keep changing the postcode, or at least the address. It was called Philadelphia because it was founded by a man called Attalus, who had a brother, Emenes, whom he loved so dearly. Everybody knew this king really loved his brother. He honored him, looked after him. And uh, so they actually called the city after his brotherly love. And Philadelphia means brotherly love. That's why they called the city in America Philadelphia. They wanted it to be a city of brotherly love, though it's not quite that today, as you know. Then it changed, and they called it Neo-Caesarea in honor of the Roman emperor, in gratitude to Tiberius, who had actually helped them financially to rebuild after the earthquake during his reign. And so in gratitude, they changed the name from Philadelphia to Neo-Caesarea, which means New Caesar. It's a bit like New York. Uh, they simply took the name Caesar and then called the town New Caesarea. And then later it changed again after another emperor, the Emperor Vespasian, and they renamed the city after his family surname, and they called it Flavia. So they were used to changes of names. The city was constantly getting a new name. And you find that Jesus keeps pointing out, I'm going to give you a new name, three new names. And the city had had three new names. So that's a little bit about the background. What do we know about the church? Well, we know just one thing. It was small. It was a struggling little group. And they had an inferiority complex about it. Well, I mean, can you imagine with Sardis up the road? the live church that everybody said, now, if you want a live church, don't go to Philadelphia. They're, they're a faithful but struggling little cause, you know, but if you want a live church, go up the road to Sardis. You can almost hear them talk. And poor little Philadelphia, next door to Sardis, feels so small. 
and th they were obviously not having a great deal of influence on the city and uh, not growing terribly fast. Oh, but Jesus has a letter <laughs> and he wants to say to that little church, he doesn't want to speak sternly to them. He won't discourage them at all, especially after the letter to Sardis. As I've said, they must have wondered what on earth he was going to say to them. But what a relief. <laughs> they must have looked at each, at each other after it was read in church and said, Whew, we're okay. <laughs> and Jesus meant them to think that. It's the longest self-description of Jesus of the whole lot. If you compare the self-description, it is the longest. No, we're not just going statistically by size, but it, it's almost as if he's saying, you're the least important church of the seven, but you're the most important to me. I want to talk to you. The body may be weak, but the head is strong. He's saying, you've got all you need in me. You may be small and insignificant and not influential, but you've got me. And he calls himself by a number of lovely titles. First of all, he talks about what he is, and then he talks about what he does. Firstly, what he is, he said, I'm holy and true. I'm the holy one, literally. And that is a title for God, used even in this book of Revelation. One of the striking things about Revelation is that the same titles are applied to both God and to Jesus. Nothing could be clearer that Jesus is God. Uh, titles like uh, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. They replied to God in Revelation 1 and to Jesus in, at the end. And here's a title, the Holy One. That's one of the titles of God in the book of Isaiah. It's Isaiah's favorite title for God, the Holy One of Israel. And here's Jesus saying, I'm the Holy One. I'm God. You've got all you need in me. Then he says, and I'm the true one. Now, one of the interesting things in the Greek language is this, that the word true and the word real are the same word. Therefore, wherever you see true in uh, Scripture, you, in the New Testament, you can change it for the word real. When Jesus says, I am the truth, he's saying, I'm for real. When he says, I'm the true vine, I'm the real vine. And he said that when he was looking at the metal vine on the gates of the temple. Piece of beautiful wrought copper work. But he says, I'm the real vine. I'm the real bread of heaven, not the manna. I'm the real bread. It's, it's lovely. I just love switching those two words around in Scripture. I'm real. And you see, truth is what corresponds to reality. Do you follow me? If a thing is true, it, it is real. If it's untrue, it's unreal. And so truth and reality are the same thing. I am for real. I am the true one, the real one. Now he moves to what he does. And I think at this point, I must find my Bible and read something to you from the prophet Isaiah because it is so striking. It's in Isaiah chapter 22. I'm not even sure how much to read. Uh, I think I'll read quite a bit. It says, this is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says, go and say to this steward, to Shebna, who is in charge of the palace, what are you doing here? And who gave you permission to cut out a grave for yourself here, hewing your grave on the height and chiseling your resting place in the rock? Beware, the Lord is about to take firm hold of you and hurl you away, O oh, you mighty men. He will roll you up tightly like a ball and throw you into a large country, and there you will die, and there your splendid chariots will remain, your, disgra your disgrace to your master's house. I will depose you from your office, and you will be ousted from your position. In that day I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and fashion your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. And he will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David and what he opens no one can shut and what he shuts no one can open. I can't believe that that wasn't in Jesus' mind when he wrote this letter. And it's the story of a steward 
who had the keys to David's palace, and therefore had the most power to open rooms and let people in and open doors and let people out. He was second only to the king in authority, and Shebna became big-headed, and he thought he was even more important than the king, and he started building a stone tomb to himself like a royal tomb. After all, I have the key of David. I'm somebody. And God deliberately kicked that man out of the country, and he died somewhere else. He'd been collecting chariots and all sorts of things. He'd been lining his own nest because he was the key holder of David's palace. And in his place, Eliakim was put a man who was humble, a man who was reliable, a man who was trustworthy, and he got the key to the palace. And what he opened, no man could shut. What he shut, no man could open. Jesus is here claiming to be the fulfillment of that man Eliakim with all the world's rulers who strut around and make big tombs. Jesus is the humble one the reliable one who now has the authority to the king's palace. There's so much more we could say, but I'm sure it comes out of that Old Testament. Uh, once again, these letters keep referring back to the Old Testament. Do you know that in the book of Revelation, there are over 400 allusions to the Old Testament? If you don't know your Old Testament, you won't understand most of the book of Revelation. Maybe that's why a lot of Christians don't understand it. But there are constant allusions because actually Peter says that it was Jesus who told the prophets what to say about himself. And so we have Jesus with the key of David. I have the key to the king's palace. And if I open a door, nobody can shut it. He's the reliable. He's the humble one as well as the holy one. He's the reliable one, the trustworthy one. Well, now he gets on with the letter. He says, I know your deeds. You have little strength, means either in numbers or influence. They were insignificant, but not to the Lord. There were three things that were good in this little church. Number one, you've kept my word. And to keep the word is not just to treasure it. It means to obey it. You've done whatever I told you. Now, what joy that must bring to the Lord when he can say of a church, they've done everything I've told them. That's the secret of real success, to do only those things that the head of the church tells you to do. So simple. And this little group of faithful Christians, everything Jesus told them, they did. No argument, no saying, well, that's impossible here. They just did it. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. Not only was obedience characteristic of this church, but courage was too. They also had faced this test of their courage to say they were Christians openly, to say Jesus is Lord rather than Caesar is Lord, and they'd done it, and they'd not denied his name. Furthermore, it says they had endured patiently. Patience, we heard a lot about that earlier from Mark. Love is patient. You can wait. Now, you can get very impatient when you don't see quick results. We live in an instant age. Not just instant tea and coffee, but we want everything by next Tuesday or Thursday at the latest. We want to see the church immediately successful. We want things now. It's because we live in an existential rather than an eschatological age. Boy, there are two big words for you. <laughs> Eschatological means you live for the future. Existential means you live for the present. And I'm afraid what we're getting is an existential rather than eschatological gospel. A gospel which is more concerned with delivering people from their hang-ups than from hell. You understand what I'm saying? A gospel that's becoming too preoccupied with the personal and political problems of the present and is overlooking the future that God is planning for us. We are the people of tomorrow. We live for the future. The kingdom is tomorrow breaking into today. We can have a foretaste now, but no more. And we are looking and longing for the full kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. We are eschatological people. That word means living for the future, for the end. And that should profoundly affect our behavior in the present. But when you become a church that's just living for the present, one of the first things to go is patience. 
Bible constantly says, wait patiently for that future. It's coming. James says in his letter, the farmer is patient, waiting for the crop to come. Then why are you so impatient? You can get so impatient that the kingdom is not coming. Want it now. No, you've waited patiently. I, I get a lovely feel for this little group of people. They were obeying the Word of God. They were courageous. They didn't deny His name. And they waited patiently for the future, certain it was going to come. So they were loyal rather than lively, faithful rather than full, and steadfast rather than successful. Jesus would rather have a small church like Philadelphia than a large church like Sardis or Laodicea. We must realize what Jesus is looking for and what he really wants and then give it to him. Well, he makes three special promises for their immediate future, one of which he's already got in hand. He's already begun to do one of these things, but he says, three things I'm going to do for you. And uh, I just list them. I'm afraid I'm guilty of alliteration so often. That's the province of fools, poets, and Plymouth Brethren, I'm told. But anyway, <laughs> I, I got the disease from somewhere, but uh, you had it this morning, Mark, so why shouldn't I? Well, here are the three things he promises them. Increase, influence, and immunity. Now, let's look at these three lovely promises. Influence. He says, I've set before you an open door. You may think you can't do much, but look, I've opened an opportunity for you. You just go through. He's really saying, Philadelphia is my missionary town, not to spread Greek culture, but to spread my good news. And really, you can't do much if, if the Lord doesn't open a door for you. You try and evangelize where the Lord hasn't opened a door. You'll find in Paul's letters frequent mention of the word door, and it's always a door that has opened to preach the word. A great and effectual door has been opened for me. The Lord opens these doors. Sometimes we're so busy trying to batter a closed door down that we didn't see the door that he was opening, which was probably in quite a different area. See, let me mention two doors the Lord has opened wide in our country. First, the door into prisons. The key of David has opened prison doors, and the gospel is sweeping through some of the prisons of our land and preparing evangelists in there who, when they're released, will come out and show some of us up. So why door is opened? I'll tell you another door I'm excited about. We, we had a representative here last time we were videoing from the gypsies. Were any of you here? When you'll remember the lovely talk he gave us in the morning worship. I'm constantly in touch with the gypsies. I, I think the last phone call was about a week ago. And it's just so exciting to hear how the Spirit has opened a door. Do you know there's not a gypsy family in England that hasn't got a Christian in it now? The proportion of gypsies who now love the Lord is higher than for any other ethnic group. I'm not talking about the travelers now, I'm talking about the Roman gypsies. And Jim and I have visited a camp outside Leicester where every caravan had uh, stickers for Jesus in it. <laughs> And they turned a barn in which they used to keep their old painted caravans into a little church. You've never seen such a collection of chairs, all from rubbish dumps with uh, <laughs> sagging seats, but they've collected chairs from everywhere. And, and there's a pastor preaching there morning and evening every Sunday, and he can't even read. He gets his messages from the Lord. <laughs> the Spirit teaches him. And I'm astonished. They ring me up and ask about Bible teaching, but you know, they don't ring me up and say, what does this mean? They ring me up and say, I've read this, and I think this is what it means. And you know, they are spot on. I don't need to guide them. I say, the Spirit has told you the meaning. You don't need to ask me. Well, I, I want confirmation. And so we've been distributing tapes and videos among them, because for those who can't read, this is a way of getting teaching through. But here are two doors the Lord has opened wide, and there are many Christians sitting in church on Sunday that haven't even seen them and don't know about them. See, when Jesus opens the door, no one can shut it. We should be keeping our eyes open for the doors that he opens and grab those opportunities. And if he shuts the door, you can batter it for all you're worth, but you'll never get it open again. And he says to Philadelphia, you're small, you're maybe insignificant in your own eyes, but I've set before you an opportunity. If you take it, you're going to influence many. 
Second, influence even on their enemies. Now, they were having real trouble from the Jewish traders and the synagogue, and Jesus has no compunction about calling it a synagogue of the devil. They're trying to close this little church down, and Jesus says, I'm going to humiliate them. I'm going to bring them, and they're going to fall down on their knees before you and say, you're the people of the Messiah, not us. The Messiah loves you. <laughs> we can see it. Can you imagine that? The best way to get rid of an enemy, of course, is to turn them into a friend. And uh, that's what's going to happen. They're going to come and join you and say, we're sorry for what we've said about you. Can you imagine that? How they would feel then? So they're, they're going to increase. A door for the gospel is open. They're going to influence. Even their enemies are going to see the love of Christ in them and come and humble themselves and say, you got it and we haven't. And thirdly, immunity. They were small. They couldn't take much persecution. And so Jesus said, there's a wave of trouble going to come right through, but I'm going to keep you from it. Now, some, unfortunately, have built on that promise, uh, the secret rapture, we're all going to be taken away before the trouble comes. This is only promised to Philadelphia, I want you to notice, and it's promised to a small, faithful church, and Jesus is going to give them special protection. He doesn't say he's going to protect anybody else. It's going to be an hour of trial for everybody, of testing, but it's a promise of great encouragement, of special concern. I'm going to take special good care of you when these troubles hit. Lovely promise. See, Jesus is concerned about a small but faithful church. His advice says, I'm coming soon. Once again, this thought of the parousia, the return of Christ, is going to be something that will hold this church together and keep it faithful. All they need is perseverance. Hold on to what you have. Similar to Sardis, but here all of them are holding on. Sardis, only a few names. See that no one will take your crown. That doesn't mean that somebody else will grab their crown and wear it themselves. It's see that nobody robs you of the reward that will come. The crown is so often in Scripture the equivalent of the gold and silver and bronze medals at the Olympic. It, but then they didn't hang something around your neck. They put a wreath of olive leaves stoned together on your head. This was the crown. It's the crown of somebody who's won through, who's run the race, who's touched the finishing post first, someone who's persevered, who's kept at it, and who's stayed with it. A lovely reward. The promise for the future is fascinating, uh, for a reason we'll come to in a moment. He promises first that they will be a pillar in the temple of my God. Some people have thought, but then in uh, Revelation 21, in the New Jerusalem, there is no temple. Yes, there is actually. If you read the next line, it says, for God and the Lamb will be the temple. It will be a personal temple, and you will be a pillar in that temple. Now, already in the New Testament, Peter, James, and John have been called pillars of the church. And we use the phrase as well, don't we? He's, she's a pillar of the church, meaning somebody who's always there, who's reliable, who's supportive. You can depend on them. It's a very strong uh, picture, a pillar in the church. And most churches have such pillars. Some have more than others. It's not always all the members, but to be a pillar of the church and to be a pillar of the temple of God. It means to be a permanent part of God, part of Him. And then come these new names, three new names, the name of my God. Now, in the days in Philadelphia of which we're speaking, there were a lot of pillars with names on it. It was their way of honoring citizens, the way of making them freemen of the city. You got your name on a pillar. But often on those pillars was the name Dionysius, the name of their God. But in fact, Jesus says, I'll inscribe on you the name of my God and the name of my city, the city of my God, this new Jerusalem that's coming. And my new name, now I told you that Jesus has 250 names and titles, but he's going to get more. And I don't know what we're going to call him. 
when we live with him in the new Jerusalem. You don't either. He is going to have a new name. It won't be Jesus. It won't be Christ. What will it be? Well, I haven't a clue. I'm, I'm, I nearly said I'm dying to find out. But <laughs> um, I remember when I said once I'm dying to get see the new Jerusalem and the man in the congregation said, you will, David, you will. <laughs> well, we will one day. And that name will be written on us too. He will own us. We belong to him. What will it be? What would we call him? Something that nobody's ever called him yet. It will belong to his new phase of existence in a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem when everything's been made new and therefore there'll be new names. Incidentally, you'll have a new name too. Jesus usually gave new names to those who followed him. He called Simon, which means a reed shaken in the wind. He called him Peter, a rock. He actually called James and John sons of thunder, <laughs> which tells you quite a bit about their temperament. Well, did they hang on? Did Philadelphia come through? When Islam swept across Asia Minor, the last Christian bastion was Philadelphia. Would you believe it? It was the last one to give in. This is when the Turks conquered Philadelphia in the 14th century. Alas, tragically, they were betrayed by the church in Byzantium, that's Istanbul today, a church that was jealous of Philadelphia, and they betrayed them. They finally fell. Actually, to this day, there is an Orthodox church with an Orthodox bishop in Philadelphia. But one of the most interesting things, it is one of these living towns where there are very few ruins because they're all buried under modern houses and shops and factories. But there is just one little place which still survives from the early centuries. And all you can find there are the pillars of the church. Isn't that fascinating? The letter is written into the ruins and we stood between the four pillars that held up the church, brick pillars, and we actually saw in the lower parts, you may be noticed on the video, on the lower parts we saw Christian paintings, pictures, do you remember them? And we stood there and read the letter, I will make him a pillar in the church of my God, and he won't ever go out again, never have to run for his life again. So all that remains are the pillars of a church in Philadelphia. That church had the healthiest history for the next few centuries after this letter of all the seven churches. Small, but not insignificant. <laughs> Small, but very significant. What a lovely letter. What a lovely church. A church that the world would say was a failure, but which Jesus said, that's one of my successes. <laughs>